Anime sure has a lot of dad. There's Goku, Piccolo, Vegeta, Gohan, Jin, Owen Hine, Naruto, Kurosaki Ishin, Monkey D. Dragon, Gold D. Roger, Whitebeard, and Sakata Gintuki. There's also Sho Tucker, Jiraiya, the dad from Spy X Family, Ikiri Gundo, Shank, Buggy the Clown, Grisha Yega, Umi Bold, and Yushida Shoyo. But the list can go on and on and on and on and on and on. Hello, welcome to my channel, Lost Features. Before we embark on this journey into the realities of anime dads, make sure you like, comment by answering the question, who is the worst anime dad? And don't forget to subscribe, because a lot of you do not. Ah, uh, this is, this is kind of awkward, uh, we should, let's, let's move on. Wait, wait a minute. If you can, please consider supporting the show on Patreon.com because I have been doing this all for free and the last two videos have taken a toll on me. Today we are going to answer the following questions. Why are there so many anime dads? Where do they originate from? How are they connected to Japan? How are they connected to the Manosphere and Debate Bro Spaces? This video is going to be split into four parts. The first delves into the history of the frontier and its importance to making identities, entertainment, and stories. One can say that the frontier allowed men to perform a form of masculinity and perform an American identity. However, this introduction also sets out to dismantle the myth of the frontier thesis because it popularized the notion of the man who wanders into the frontier or into the wild and attains masculinity. After the rundown of what the frontier is, I will deconstruct the frontier thesis by showing you all the vapidness of it all by introducing one of America's dads, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt's version of the frontier and what it meant to be a man still has lingering impacts in our world today, but his vision of what a man is can also be seen in Japanese workers such as the salaryman. You may ask why am I starting with the American frontier and not with Japanese dads or Japanese workers, and that's a great question. The reason is in truth, a lot of Japanese mangas and animes were influenced by the frontier or by the western, and at times these stories mirror the kind of man Roosevelt wanted Americans to be. In the second part, I look at the flip side and masculinity in Japan, where it is mostly connected to work. Most researchers have focused on the salary man, a man who places complete devotion to his work. This devotion has made many homes seem like they are fatherless, but the blame is not only on the fathers, but the hyper-capitalist nature of Japan that overworks its people and severs fathers from their families. Once I've explained this, I'll shift to explaining fatherhood itself in Japan, but also it is here where I answer the question, have the semi-fatherless homes impacted mangakas and the kind of dads that they insert in their stories? This section on masculinity in Japan will serve as a bridge to the anime and manga analysis part. The third section is going to be this light-hearted, fun, tier list of the bad anime dad trope. It's in this part where I subvert this bad anime dad trope by presenting healthy father figures who are positive, caring, and teach their children how to be good parents. The fourth and final part is the tie-up, where I explain why all of this matters and how anime dads are connected to the manosphere, but that there's also a need for positive fathers and male figures in these stories and in the real world, because if there aren't, the kids and the young adults will flock to the manosphere and listen to the lies they tell, lies that mirror the exact words of Theodore Roosevelt. Let us wander into the mythic empty frontier and the imagination of American settlers. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner boldly claimed the closing of the frontier, bringing a wave of anxiety to Americans who were still thirsty. Thirsty for a chance to conquer the so-called virgin lands of North America. The frontier thesis posed by Turner stated that Europeans became Americans through the use of a frontier as the taming of wild lands made them into a more superior man, an American. In Turner's narrative of the frontier, 
the reader is to understand that the frontier was this empty land with no inhabitants, and this void of people allowed white Americans to seize land and cultivate it. Lies, really. A historical lies. Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the f up. Even games such as Red Dead Redemption 1 and 2 show the greater truths while also satirizing the West. For a more historically accurate frontier, play some Assassin's Creed 3 because that frontier map was actually home to many indigenous nations. So, in truth, at the start of the settlement, the frontier was explained to be this darkness where the so-called Indian eyes watched settlers, but in this unknown, a curiosity was bred, a curiosity that would cause many to enter the frontier to explore it or to become hunters. Many did not go alone, but with indigenous guides who helped European explorers and hunters find their way through this so-called frontier. What changed the understanding of the frontier was the knowledge that vast riches lay west, and they are awaiting a plundering. Americans thus fought bloody wars and would attempt to exterminate the indigenous people to steal their lands. The so-called closing of the frontier was not an actual closing because even in 1893, bloody wars were still being fought. However, by this time, the West was seeping into the imagination of Americans and the stories of the West and the frontier created a set piece or a setting where white masculinity can be placed in relation to the indigenous other. The stories that took place in this fictional setting of the West justified the bloody takeover and justified the colonization of land. What was so insidious of Turner's thesis was the complete omission of indigenous people which fed into the myth of the vanishing, disappearing Indian. A myth that spread the idea that indigenous people were going extinct which fed into racist beliefs of white supremacy and manifest destiny. Turner popularized the setting of the West and his thesis became a historical foundation for future histographies of the West. The myth and the fear of the indigenous other became a cornerstone in cowboy and pioneer stories. Stories that validated the takeover of land. Stories that buffed up white masculinity and white men as they were depicted in saving white women from indigenous or the savage Indian. Stories that excluded Mexicans, indigenous peoples, and African Americans and the roles they played in making the frontier, in making America. The stories that came after Turner completely disregarded the complex networks that were taking place on this frontier and the people that lived there much before the Europeans arrived. However, many of these stories were also impacted by the white elites of the time, the bourgeoisie, such as Theodore Roosevelt and his ideas on race, masculinity, and the frontier. Who was Theodore Roosevelt and why is he so important to anime dads? Theodore Roosevelt was the son of wealthy daddy Roosevelt and was the heir to his family's fortune. When he was a child, he was extremely weak and frail so his father placed him in the outdoors to strengthen him and it seemed as if the frontier healed the boy and apparently made him into a strong man. With a wealthy upbringing and a recognition of his weakness, Roosevelt was aware that the elites of New York were becoming too fixed on their wealth and were living lazy lives. In response to this, Roosevelt began to write history that backed Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. But Roosevelt's reason for writing history differed, for he wanted to re cement traditional elite values. And he wrote out of a fear, a fear that American society was ill and he diagnosed these problems as symptoms of racial decline and gender disorder, stating in his 1899 speech, The Strenuous Life. The man must be glad to do a man's work, to dare and endure and to labor, to keep himself and to keep those dependent upon him. The woman must be the housewife, the helpmeet of the homemaker the wise and fearless mother of many healthy children. When men fear work or fear righteous war, when women fear motherhood, they tremble on the brink of doom. And well it is that they should vanish from the earth, where they are fit subjects of the scorn of all men and women who are themselves strong and brave and high-minded. 
Part of his reasons in writing history was that he saw a so-called degradation of masculinity in America as it was in this moment where mass immigration arrived from Europe and industrialization brought working class people and leisure to the cities. According to Roosevelt, these new men were weaklings and they were inferior as many carried with them progressive ideas and were against the brutal American work culture. However, one must ask, why did Roosevelt hate these men? Why did he look down upon them? Why did he tell the wealthy Chicago elite that they were the leaders? The timid man, the lazy man, the man who distrusts his country, the over-civilized man who has lost the great fighting, masterful virtues, the ignorant man, and the man of dull mind, whose soul is incapable of feeling the mighty lift that thrills stern men with empires in their brains. All of these, of course, shrink from seeing the nation undertake its new duties, shrink from seeing us build a navy and an army adequate to our needs, shrink from seeing us do our share of the world's work by bringing order out of the chaos in the great, fair, tropic islands from which the valor of our soldiers and sailors has driven the Spanish flag. While Roosevelt hated the poor, the lazy man, the striker, and any man who did not live up to the American ideal, Roosevelt was a fearful man who feared many things, such as the labor tensions at the time where workers rose up and challenged the elites of society and halted their so-called progress. Roosevelt was a man of order and wished to keep these so-called inferior men in their place. He was also fearful that the white race was dying off and degrading as normal whites were starting to mix with immigrants. Roosevelt sought to stop this mixing because in his fearful eyes, white men were becoming too weak. His solution to this weakness was the frontier where white men can conquer the wild and return to the city to re-establish their dominance in society. They could attain what he called barbarian virtues. In his book Barbarian Virtues, Matthew Fry Jacobson explains Roosevelt's view on race clearly. Roosevelt's obsession with race led him to promote and publicly support eugenics. Side note, if you haven't noticed it yet, this is actually super relevant to current times, as many white men in America still hold the belief and a fear of a white replacement. Just like our buddy here, Roosevelt. Also, the talk about order and work sure reminds me of a Jordan B. Unlike Turner, who believed it was the farmer who civilized the frontier, Roosevelt believed it was the hunter who brought civility to the wilderness. For the hunter was the one who policed the wild animals and wild people, according to Roosevelt. The hunter at the time was considered this primitive being, but Roosevelt's hunter contested this, as it was the hunter who allowed the bourgeoisie to attain capital, and it was the hunter who defended such capital. Thus, the hunter stood for progress. Roosevelt was confident in this version of the frontier thesis because he was a hunter and found hunting restorative. However, Roosevelt was not simply placing hunting as this activity for all white men, but for the wealthy elites, so they could reassert their dominance through their hunting club and conquer lands through the physical activity of hunting. Through hunting, the elites were able to mark vast areas of the continent for their privileged rights, and anyone who wanted to use this land to live off of it were considered trespassers. When Roosevelt became president, the frontier thesis was well spread, and many Americans believed it was the end of the conquering madness. But to Roosevelt, the act of conquering was what made white supreme, and so he began to create new west and new frontiers to conquer so that white Americans can restore their manhood and position in society. For Roosevelt, Africa was Europe's west and frontier, so he looked at China, Latin America, and the Philippines. It was in these lands where the frontier would be remade and white Americans could restore their manhood by conquering foreign lands and placing their dominance on the native people. Most of all, this masculinity would allow normal Americans to be men and to be loyal to the American capitalist project because striking was considered unmanly. Instead, men had to toil, work, and never complain. This version of masculinity is the very image of the Japanese salaryman, the Japanese form of masculinity, but we'll get there in a second because there's something else that must be mentioned. It is important to note 
Roosevelt's version of the frontier and the process of becoming a man from boyhood influenced the Boy Scouts of America founded in 1910. Roosevelt backed the project because he thought it was a good way to ensure boys didn't fail and were transformed into the ideal man he continuously chased. Roosevelt believed that for boys to become men, they had to go out there into the wild and hunt and kill and conquer new frontiers to become men. This wild frontier, however, was purposely vague because part of the mission of the Boy Scouts was to train young boys into becoming loyal soldiers who will go into the frontier or the battlefield and become men by hunting other men. War and the performance of masculinity are intrinsically tied. The basic process is actually a foundation for many stories and shonen mangas. Later on, I'll show you how many mangas feature a boy who goes into the wild. There are, but the Japanese stories differ because the aim is not always manhood. Before we go to Japan, let us first take a trip to Africa. Roosevelt's field trip to Africa was caused by the elite urge to hunt and murder big game. But he also traveled to Africa so that his own sons could transcend boyhood by hunting wild animals. Roosevelt's African hunting trip is disgusting and his performance of masculinity by hunting elephants with a big gun is a case study of how vapid this form of traditional masculinity can be. How vapid proving yourself to be a man is and also showcasing it to the entire world. The trip further reveals Roosevelt's insecurity of the colonization projects, as in his visit he is surrounded by Africans who are given the task of guiding him and protecting him. Thus, he returns back to his real self because without these guides, at any moment the Roosevelts could have been eaten by a pack of lions, a fate that was very common amongst European settlers. In truth, the colonization missions in Africa, North America, Australia, India, and Asia were partially made possible because the indigenous people gifted or were forced to give Europeans ancestral knowledge about the land. The knowledge these indigenous peoples held demonstrates different models of being which included living with nature and not conquering it. A far more civilized method than conquering and destroying lands which is exactly what the Europeans did on every land they stepped on. In looking at the collective history of colonization, one can see that without this knowledge, European settlers would have perished. However, the stories of these indigenous peoples and their aid have been quietly suppressed because the white men apparently did it all on their own, when in reality, without guides, white men were often eaten or succumbed to disease. Oh, 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 here's a fun fact. It also shows that the Roosevelts were probably pro-slavery as he sees these African laborers as servants and they are the ones who do all the true labor while he sits away from their so-called barbarism. Finally, Roosevelt's sons mirror the shodan protagonist who must always prove themselves to their dads. As his sons kill and find joy in hunting with their father, they find joy in making him happy and receiving that validation that they transcended boyhood. If these boys cowered, they would have been considered as failures, losers, wimps, and weaklings. Roosevelt was a terrible father who casted his ideal form of masculinity on his sons and pressured them to achieve what he had achieved. He is, in truth, one of the shittiest American dads, and Peter Griffin, the man that looks just like him, is a better dad. <laughs> With that in mind, let us travel to Japan and explore Japanese masculinity, corporate culture, and fatherhood. In my Attack on Titan video, I explain a thing called Japanism and its impacts on Japanese society pre-war and during the war. But one of the things I left out was its impacts on post-war society. One of the core aspects of Japanism that was explored by Tosaka Jun was to transform men into soldiers by valorizing and creating a mythic samurai image. 
This mythic samurai image was created for the sole purpose of fostering devotion to the emperor and to the state. This devotion allowed the Japanese to fight a war without mercy, a war of extermination, and a war to the bitter death, as many Japanese men sacrificed their lives for the state. However, this essay is centered on a post-war Japan, and the state had to quickly transition a population that was geared for war into a population that would fight its economic battles to restore Japan after the war. They did this by tying the mythic samurai to the salary man, and so men were convinced that they can regain their honor or their masculinity by working. The focus of most stories in post-war Japan are usually centered on the economic miracle following the war, as after the 1950s, the economy kept rising and by the 1970s, Japan was riding what economists call a boom. Although Japan was becoming economically strong, the nation maintained traditional positions on marriage, gender roles, and immigration. The man was supposed to work and perform his masculinity by working and maintaining a nuclear family while women were to stay at home and raise the kids. Although Japan took a lot of pride in the salary man, as they were placed on a pedestal for bringing the Japanese economic victories, in reality, their existence was hurting the children being born and raised. How? Well, first they normalized a work culture of overwork and that success stemmed from devotion to corporations. And these children took after their fathers who toiled day in and day out. Hence, the cycle continued. But everything was forever until it was no more. Because the Japanese economy turned out to be a bubble. And when it popped in the 1990s, the bust would strike many parents and young adults with a psychological blow. Key shifts occurred in the 90s. First, the stagnation brought neoliberal reforms. And secondly, to further combat stagnation, more women entered the workforce. The women who began to work were able to dodge marriage and became vocal in their option to not marry workaholic men. Thirdly, the bust also caused men and women to work more overtime, spending less time with their families and more time at work. At this point, the fatherless homes that were initially caused by Japan's capitalistic drive to become economically strong worsened because Japan entered hyper-capitalism thanks to neoliberalism. Although women entered the workforce in mass, the patriarchal and hierarchical corporate structures caused a rampant sexual harassment and sexual abuse. Women and workers who did not perform masculinity were not equal to their male counterparts. Corporations pressed these people by elevating male workers and by demoralizing workers who did not fit the masculine ideal. Before we jump into fatherhood in Japan and the impacts capitalism has caused, one must also understand that workplaces used the principles of Japanism to create hierarchies and force devotion to the corporation. Fathers who dared to take leaves when their wives needed them were seen as traitors to the corporation and were met with scorn. What researchers have found was that many men did not care and made their wives carry the entire burden of childbirth, but some men did care. Those who did care and wanted an equal relationship with their wives faced pressure from their corporation and their bosses. The faced pressure emerged because for the Japanese capitalists or the elite, it is considered a norm for ordinary workers to sacrifice everything for the corporation. This included, and still includes, fatherhood. Furthermore, many of these corporations are modeled after a father-son relationship where the employee offers complete respect and loyalty to their bosses or their fathers. This relationship strains working class men from asking for a leave to spend time with their children and be dads. Instead, men who work in these corporations must show an infinite amount of gratitude to their bosses, their fathers, and must dedicate their hearts to the corporation. The expectations here mirror the masculinity that Teddy Roosevelt desired from the working class people of America. 
where the ideal worker was one who dedicated their hearts to the American cause and worked without any protest for the benefit of the leaders, the capitalists, the elites. This is exactly what has occurred in Japan, but Japanese capitalism has been using a rooted Japanism and traditional values to encage their workers and work them to death. Although I say Japanese homes are semi-fatherless, it was initially meant that fathers spent most of their time at work and thus the home for a span of years remains fatherless. Yet, and sadly so, homes are also fatherless because many workers in Japan are worked to death. <laughs> Gee, that got really dark. I guess Japan isn't really the utopia people think it is. There's a dark side to it all, and to the anime we consume, to the manga we read, and to those games we play, millions upon millions of workers are out there creating art for the West. No, for the world. But what's the cost? What's the price? Should gamers or anime watchers be supporting such a hideous industry? Such an exploitative industry? This essay isn't really about that, but if you're interested, I'll make a video about it all, calling it the dark side of the anime manga games industry in Japan. With that history of fatherhood in Japan out of the way, we can unpack this topic at hand with more precision. Many scholars who have investigated the salaryman and Japanese work culture have found that men tend to cling onto more traditional norms. In response, the Japanese government have seemingly taken initiatives to disrupt this behavior, but to many scholars, these are symbolic acts. The main pressing issue for the government is in fact the descending birth rates which are connected to workaholic men who care more about their jobs and fostering healthy relationships and creating a family based off equality. This workaholic and complete devotion to work has in turn turned off many Japanese women. But many women see marriage as a traditional trap where if they do get married to a traditional Japanese man they will be pressured into the duties of a traditional wife. Hence, many women have chosen not to get married and instead live their lives and enjoy the freedom. In a greater context, those who have been raised in Japan and go on to create manga, consciously or unconsciously, always place an anime dad figure in their manga. This reused and old trope exists because many of the semi-fatherless homes in Japan and the dads who have chosen work over spending time with their families. The way I see it, it is a reflection of how current Japanese society behaves. But in anime or manga, the depiction of the father is actually much more generous to the Japanese father and many mangakas have gone on to challenge traditional masculinity and the cold stoic father stereotype. Before I show you what I mean by going over some anime dads, let's tie part 1 and part 2 together to form an equation of sorts. On one hand, you have the frontier thesis, which has influenced the stories told of the West and of the boy who wanders into the frontier to attain masculinity. These stories of the West have considerably influenced Japanese storytelling, as you only have to look at Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, and Bakano. Furthermore, many shonens feature the young boy who wanders into the wild and becomes powerful from it. Sometimes these characters gradually become men. Other times their transformation is sudden, like Gun Gun <laughs> or Naruto. And other times they remain the same age forever. On the other hand, many mangakas who write and draw manga live in a society where fathers are not fully present at home. This lack of a father figure has led many mangakas to express their distant father by writing in a distant father figure who almost always chooses work over family. Now, if we do some math here and combine both parts of this equation, we get the bad anime dad trope and the young boy who chases after their father for recognition, love, and to be worthy. However, and this is a big however, the bad anime dad trope is not monolithic and is presented differently by different mangakas because they all have different relationships with their fathers. And without further ado, let's fucking go! The worst anime dads are those who experiment on their children. The first being Sho Tucker from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. This man is not a father, but a monster. In transforming his own daughter and her dog into a kimura, Tucker stands as the worst anime dad in existence. Just terrible. 
Below Tucker is Judge from One Piece. Judge oozes out Theodore's principles of manhood and success as Judge experiments on his own children and measures the results from the powers he places into them. Of the four brothers, Sanji was deemed as a failure for being weak and not having any powers or enhancements. In being a judge of his own children's process, he would banish Sanji and lock him in a dungeon. But Sanji was not a failure because he was the only one who had a human heart and actually cared about other beings. Plus, all of Sanji's failures, according to Luffy, are Sanji's prime achievements. Now, Sanji is a pervert and a creep, and maybe one day I'll touch on the perverted side of anime and manga, but today is not that day. Let us move on to our next category. The Salaryman Dad, or the Dad That Abandons His Family. The first on this list, and by far the worst in this category, is Jin Freaks. Father of Gun from Hunter x Hunter. Now it can be argued that Jin did not necessarily abandon the boy as Mito won custody, but it is implied that Jin would have left anyways because he is always searching for what he does not have. Anyhow, Jin is your typical salaryman dad with the exception that he doesn't return home and he doesn't actually provide for his family. He's like a greedy salaryman who also goes out into the wild to explore and hunt. Thus, Jin mirrors Teddy Roosevelt, but this void of a fatherhood also causes Gun to chase after him and hunt him. Throughout the show, Gun expresses his ambition to find his father and prove his worth to him. However, Jin is a bit of a jerk and thinks if Gun seeks him out with a friend, he is a coward. After the Kimura Ant arc, Leorio calls Jin out for being a terrible father and for not even checking on his hospitalized son. It is here where the reader realizes that Jin feels ashamed to face his son after the years of abandonment. Even when Gun recovers, it's not Jin who is running and embracing the boy, it's Leorio. Jin is instead still hiding from his son. Tayashi at least mends the relationship and by the end of the series, Gun has Jin on speed dial showing that there is now a bridge of communication. But Gun does not see Jin as a father and more like an estranged uncle. When I reread the series, I came to the conclusion that Takashi must have had a rocky relationship with his father, who may have been a salaryman who was obsessed with work and thus was distant and cold. I didn't look much into the author's life, but it sure feels like Takashi himself at some point wanted to be worthy of his father's praise. Or is it that Takashi saw this happening around him and thus wrote a story around a boy looking and hunting for his distant workaholic father? A story a lot of boys in the 90s and the 2000s would have understood and vibed with. Second on the list is Naruto because by the end of the show and the manga and the beginning of Baruto, he actually doesn't learn anything and becomes the typical salaryman dad who is so focused on work that he abandons his son causing Baruto to mirror Naruto's actions. And I didn't really read or watch Baruto because it felt like, Ah oh, shit, here we go again. So I don't know if Naruto becomes a better dad. Uh, I don't know answering the questions. Is Naruto considered a good dad now or is he still a bad anime dad? The final bad dad that fits into this tier of bad anime dads who are workaholics is son Goku who continuously abandons his family to go off to train and become stronger. He's such a bad dad that Vegeta calls him out. The lack of fathership also causes Piccolo to step in and become Gohan's true father. That's right folks, Piccolo is a good anime dad. He's actually a really positive father figure to Gohan. Like, no jokes, no memes, just, just flat out, the dude just backs Gohan and, and is there for him more than Goku. Um, anyways, let's move on to the bad anime dad that turns good. You're pretty good. You're pretty The next tier is the bad dad turned good. So first we have Hohenheim from Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood. Hohenheim follows a similar pattern to Hunter Hunter except the two boys are not looking for their father but a way to restore their bodies due to a grave mistake they made. A mistake that is caused kind of because their father wasn't there to guide them after their mother's death. 
Hohenheim is your typical salaryman dad, but he's on a mission to save the world and stop the dwarf in the flask. At first, we see the abandonment through his son's eyes. But Edward is an angry, annoying, and rash boy. Thus, Edward's perspective only shows the coldness in his father's eyes and doesn't actually give us a reason to why Hohenheim left his family. Rather, it's through Hohenheim's perspective we find out that he is actually a philosopher's stone in human form and has millions of souls crying inside of him. He sees himself more as a monster than a human. Although he desires to show the boy's affection and love, he can't because he feels like a monster. A person unworthy. He also cries during the family photo shoot, showing the reader that he's actually a big softy in the inside. When he is reunited with Edward and Al, he doesn't expect them to forgive him, but Al opens up and bonds with his dad. This rebonding is actually super sweet and redeems Hohenheim but it also performs as a mirror to the other father in the show, making Hohenheim, by the end of the series, a pretty good dad. Hideaki Sorachi's manga, Gintama, has a lot of dads, but one of the earliest shown to the viewer is Umibose. Umibose is the father of Gagura, who is one of the main three leads of the show, and her backstory is quite sad, as she was continuously abandoned by her father and had to look after her sick mother alone. Sorachi positions Umibose as your typical salary man father who is forced to leave his family for work. However, Umibose is an alien hunter whose work takes him to distant planets for some of his missions. The many years away from his family adds up, and in his introduction we find out this badass man is actually looking for his daughter to repair the relationship and look after her. However, he's a bit too controlling and seems to want to train Kagura in the ways of the Yato because Earth is too small for her. In contrast, Sorachi demonstrates that Kagura wishes to fight her Yato blood and become a kinder person on this Earth. At the end of this mini arc, Umibose has to trust his daughter and has a very warm conversation with Gintuki, the main character. It's here where we learn that Gintuki doesn't have a dad or parents and he never dealt with family issues. Sorachi basically drops another mystery on the main character, making him more mysterious. Anyways, Umibose like fathers are common in Japan, as they only realize that their work has seized up so much of their life after crucial moments of childhood, and thus a tinge of regret seeps into their mind, regret that they chose work over their families. But these fathers do at least make an effort to reconnect and fix the wrongs they have caused by being absent. So Umibose by the end of Gintama becomes a pretty good dad. So starting out in the good and positive dad of this tier list, we have Whitebeard, who is basically the anti-salary man. As Oda crafted a father figure who adopts those who were abandoned by their fathers and by society. His crew is made up of his sons, and although he was the closest in achieving the status of Pirate King and claiming the One Piece, he instead dreamt of having a family. One of his most troublesome sons was Portugus D. Ace, the biological son of Gol D. Roger. Whitebeard and Ace's relationship demonstrates the magic of Whitebeard's crew and his idea of positive fatherhood. See, Ace was raised in an environment that considered him the son of the devil and that he was not worthy of living, and yet Whitebeard refutes this calling the sins of the father a bullshit idea. He instead accepts Ace, knowing who his father was, and gives him a purpose to live, but also a family that Ace lacked. Despite showing a lot of attention to Ace, Whitebeard tries to show the same level of love and attention to all the sons. Although Whitebeard's relationship with each of his crew member is not fully explored, he seems like the kind of father that spent all of his days enjoying the company of his son and family. He is what fathers should aim for, and is a very positive anime dad. But is he the best dad? The 
best anime dad is Sakata Gintuki's father figure from the anime or manga Gintama. His name is Yoshido Shoyo. Although Sorachi plants the idea that Gintuki did not have any parents, later on in the manga we find out that he is a war orphan and that he did have a father figure. And I know Shoyo is Gintuki sensei, but Shoyo actively sought out the corpse eating demon and he literally picks up Gintoki, showing physical support and alluding to the idea that Shoyo adopted Gintoki. With Gintoki by his side, he would start a school with him. Although Shoyo would adopt more children impacted by the war, the bond between Gintoki and Shoyo differed from the other students. This is because Shoyo taught Gintoki how to be a good father figure, both directly and indirectly. Also, both Zura and Shinsuke hint at times that Gintoki was closer to their sensei, and even when Shoyo gets taken away, Gintoki holds on to his sensei's sword, a rather symbolic illustration of their bond. A positive father, in my opinion, is one who teaches his son or daughter or child in general how to be a good man or person, but also one who helps them grow and learn from their mistakes and further encourages them along their way as they grow up. Shoyo does this in their first encounter, as in Lesson 259 we find Gintuki sitting on a corpse eating as the crows flock around him. It is implied that Gintuki killed these men to eat, and so Shoyo approaches him and pats him on his head, calling him a cute demon. He would then give Gintuki his first lesson, a lesson of Shoyo's sword. The sword Shoyo carries is one that does not kill enemies. It is not a blade that cuts away your own weakness. And finally, a sword is not meant to protect the body. Rather, a sword is meant for protecting your soul. This teaching would become Gintuki's core Bushido, or his core life value, but secretly and unknown to the viewer, Shoyo teaches Gintuki that a monster sword cannot kill or defeat a monster, but instead, Monsters could only be defeated by a human sword. This is a teaching Gintoki abandons as he joins the Joy Wars and becomes known as the Shurayasha, a demon clad in all white that every single time he cut through enemy lines, he would get soaked by their blood. Gintoki in the wars becomes a monster and the show picks up at his lowest point as he had lost everything. Gintama is thus the story of Sakata Gintuki becoming a father figure to Shimura Shinpachi and Kagura, while also trying his best to follow the teachings of his father figure or sensei. One example of Gintuki being a father figure is in episode 13 when Gintuki picks up and carries Shinpachi and Kagura much like how Shoyo carried him. Here's another example. It's right after Umibos and Gintoki defeat an alien and save Gagura. They have this chat about family, and it's here where Umibos tells Gintoki that he understands Kagura better, as Gin is able to trust her. On the flip side, it's also revealed that Gintoki may know family better because he didn't have a family or parents or brothers or sisters. Shinpachi reacts to this by saying that he and Kagura are part of Gin's family. But what's Gintama really about, you might ask? Well, that's to be continued. In the next episode of Lost Futures, we're going to answer what is Gintama really about. So, stay tuned. Increasingly, we live in a world where children are lost or are ignored by their parents due to overwork and grind culture. Children who are bored out of their minds in school thus look elsewhere for father-like figures. Some find them in the animes they watch, the books they read, and even in the TikToks they swipe through. 
Whatever father figure these children are exposed to, they model them and behave in a similar fashion. But increasingly, children have been looking for father figures elsewhere, such as Jordan Peterson, Debate Bros, Andrew Tate, and the entire network of the Manosphere. The form of masculinity all three of these groups perform mirrors the traditional masculinity expressed by Theodore Roosevelt and Japanese work culture. This is what this video is really about and a reason to why I made this channel in the first place. When I was an educator, I was struck by how radicalized my students were becoming by being exposed to figures like Ben Shabibo, Debate Bros, and Peterson. Debate Bros? Yeah. Debate bros. There were moments when I was teaching indigenous history when white Canadian students tried to debate me about if there was racism in Canada. To many historians, it is an irrefutable fact. But there I was, getting challenged by a kid who did not want to step down nor admit they were wrong. I haven't been in a classroom for over two years, so this may have gotten worse. The behaviors of Andrew Tate, which children or young adults are currently mirroring, may be because there has been a lack of positive male figures in these children's lives. Positive men who push back against the facade of traditional masculinity, who contest the idea of winners and losers, who challenge the false ideas that men are degrading or that whites are apparently disappearing. There is a need for positive male figures who teach their children the positive sides of masculinity, that it's okay to be vulnerable, that it's okay to do things that are outside of gender norms, that debate bros and the alt-right are scamming young adults by preying on their insecurities, and that the cold, distant, stoic man is a facade. This lack of a positive male figure has caused many young boys to feel insecure, and this insecurity feeds into a vile misogyny, a vile transphobia, homophobia. This is something that is not only happening in the manosphere, but also in many anime communities, where male viewers get disappointed when they see their main character cry or behave in a weak manner. Many want a traditional strongman like Eren Yeager, but in truth, the traditional strongman is a facade, a performance, a shield, and a an illusion that almost always hides fear and weakness. This is proved by Ishiyama himself who at the very end depicts Eren's weakness in his confession to Armin. Look at this so-called strong man weep. That's right, Ishiyama played you like a damn fiddle! <laughs> they played us like a damn fiddle! Additionally, anime has been a space that has challenged traditional masculinity. For example, there's this Shanks line that goes something like this. Listen, Luffy. You grow up and become a man by experiencing victory and defeat, by doing difficult things and shedding tears. It's alright to cry, just overcome it. Another example is the iconic scene from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, where after Hughes' death, you have Mustang cry, showing the viewer as cold as he appears. Mustang has a heart and deeply cared and loved his best friend. There are also many manly characters who present emotion and combat the traditional masculine ideal, such as Hijinimini Ippo, who becomes this big and powerful boxer, and yet outside of the ring, he's this normal dude and a total softy. Another lovely moment is with Sakata Gintuki after the Red Spider arc where he throws a line that is similar to Shanks, saying, Weep and ask for help. Lean on me with your runny nose. Cry when you feel like crying. Laugh when you feel like laughing. When you're tearing up with an ugly face, I'll give you a good cry with an uglier face. When you're laughing so hard your stomach hurts, I'll laugh in a louder voice. That's how it should be. It's far better to get dirty while living true to yourself than to throw away yourself and die a clean death. Turb. This is Turb. Back to the matter of focus, these young adults who become stands of Peterson, Debate Bros, and Tate are used by these people as they are channeled to harass and bully marginalized people online. According to some of these fans, they become a legion working for the person that they idealize and seek to defend them by harassing marginalized people. They tend to attack black trans people and women just vile and disgusting shit. What is so insidious is that none of these groups will ever take responsibility for the harmful shit they spew. Instead, they would claim that they have no control over the children or the young adults who watch them every single day. 
What worries me is the fact that many young adults who are spending hours on Twitch.com or on YouTube.com will take these toxic ideas and express them in real life and in online spaces. What's the solution? What's the solution? Well, I for what I'm happy that Andrew Tate and Jordan Peter Guy got kicked off Twitter and other social medias. To me, they are the same guy, teaching the same things to young, white, insecure men and boys, telling children, young adults, and young men that they need to restore or reboot their masculinity by being primal, that they need to have what Theodore Roosevelt called barbarian virtues. Secondly, those who are pushing toxic traditional masculinity, those who express it through winning debates and calling those who refuse to debate them unmanly or weak, and those who regularly express the notion that might is right have to acknowledge what they're doing is wrong and that it is harming marginalized people. Peterson and Tate spaces are knowingly filled with racists, transphobes, and white supremacists. But debate spaces are also filled with people who channel young men to harass people of color and spread toxic masculinity by the very fact that they refuse to admit when they are wrong and when they are causing harm. For it is in the debate bro playbook that they cannot be wrong. For if they are, they will be exercising the virtues of a timid person instead a legion is formed and set out to attack marginalized people much like those who came before them the anti-sjw's so two debate bros do fucking better thirdly in researching this extensively i think it's time for parents to pay attention to their kids and for parents to put family above work i know it's a controversial statement since the old generation loves to work but if you have a child reach out to them Try to show them some positive masculine vibes. If you need a guide on how to be a cool dad, check out that dang dad. He's a pretty awesome dad. And, you know, I'm not a dad, so I can't really give you the advice you need. <laughs> also, to the young adults watching this, seek out your parents. Because they might not actually be cold or avoiding you, but instead might not know how to communicate. Or there isn't much of a bond, which sounds really bad but you know you still have time to build that bond so go out there and turn your bad anime dad of a dad into a good anime dad <laughs> finally i think we ought to challenge the patriarchy and hierarchies by rethinking and dismantling the nuclear family a good tangible example of this is what has occurred in Cuba, but other leftist content creators have created some amazing video essays that deconstruct the family and heterosexual norms, such as Andrew from Andrewism, who looks at a before the nuclear family or different societies that have not used the nuclear family. This is something that I forgot to mention in the section on Japanese masculinity and work and households and whatever that section was. But before Western ideas of the family shaped Japanese society, the Japanese relied on a communal childcare and child upbringing, where the community shouldered the duty of raising the child, creating a healthier space. The creators, the leftist cooks, also deconstruct the nuclear family and traditional household norms by exploring polyamory. It's something I hadn't considered, but it reminded me and taught me that there exists multiple forms of love and forms of the thing that we call family. I guess I'm still learning about this stuff as I've been asking myself, what is the role of the father? Why is there a lack of mothers in anime? Who should be responsible for guiding the youth? Should this responsibility be placed on the parents or should there be others like mentors, friends and coaches? What do communal upbringings look like? Should we organize some to replace the nuclear family? How are they organized? I feel like this video has been so focused on anime dads that I ignore others who play a part in a child or young adult's upbringing or education. The person who guided me in my, turb in my turbulent youth was a close friend who ended up being more like an elder sister. Having her by my side helped me interact with women and gave me the confidence I needed. Plus, having her as my best friend made talking to girls super normal. The creator, fantastic Mr. Fox, has a brilliant and heavy video that tackles toxic masculinity and asks men to reflect and look inward. He also struggled a bit in conjuring an image of a positive male figure. But I think that's normal because toxic masculinity has been ingrained in our minds. It's been around for hundreds of years. I also think it's wonderful that Fantastic Mr. Fox, Bellamy Rea, Mark from the Ultraviolet podcast have gathered together to create a podcast that explores positive masculinity. This is the stuff 
that needs to be worked on and taught to younger folks. So after you're finished watching this, go and check out all those creators. I think moving forward, more people need to step out to help in creating this image of a positive male figure or even a positive dad, you know? Um, I think resources need to be compiled to kind of formulate this in order to pull those who are trapped in the void that is incel and black pill communities. However, to pull people out of these toxic communities, we have to formulate a healthier version of masculinity and approach these people with empathy, which is tough to do. It really is. All in all, I hope I am wrong about all of this. I hope I am wrong. There are some essays I write that I just hope I am wrong. I hope Japanese people are not working themselves to death. I hope Japanese people are great parents. I hope the realities on the ground differ. I hope a Care Bear could just hug Andrew Tate and turn him good. I hope the new Teddy Roosevelt's are not affecting young adults. I hope shonen anime is not spreading toxic masculinity. I hope those who watch or read these stories do not chase after their father's approval. I hope future dads are like Sakata Gintuki, Whitebeard, and Regan from Mob Psycho 100. Fathers that care, fathers that have hearts, fathers that could guide the young and help them grow in any stage of their life. I hope and I hope and I hope and I hope and I hope I am wrong. But am I? That's for you to decide. Because although I did a ton of research, it reminded me of a leftist cook scene where Neil was counting the crumbs. That's what I did here. I looked at crumbs and came to a conclusion. If my conclusion is right and toxic masculinity is impacting the young, we are looking at something rather grim. Which is why I hope I am wrong. Yet, I still hope and will forever hope. In the darkest of days of editing this video, I was overcome with fear, anxiety, and temptations to give up. However, I was reminded of this community, and it's a community that gives me hope, and this hope has helped me finish this video. Finally, I hope you all didn't get bored and fell asleep halfway through. I hope you can hope. Hey folks, I want to throw a big thanks to That Dang Dad for voicing Teddy Roosevelt, Mark from the Ultraviolet podcast for being the ultimate hype guy, and finally my mentor, Turb, whose performance of Sakata Gintuki blew me away. Thank you all for watching. If you think my work is good enough, consider supporting it on patreon.com. By the way, thanks to everyone who inspired me and motivated me to create, such as Dr. Fatima, who pushed me to finish this video before the 11th because her newest video required my full attention and I kept clicking away. <laughs> so I'm going to go and watch and finish that. All right, sit down.